Okay, well, thank you for coming back again, if that's what you're doing. Um, I guess I'll just start by remarking that Smithson has probably had more written about him, certainly than any of the other artists that I'm discussing, and possibly more than all of them put together. Uh, so there's a sort of fiction, at least, of starting kind of from scratch in this lecture. Um, So this detail of a mirror trail shows one bit of Robert Smithson's activity at and around Cornell University in 1969 under the general rubric of the Cayuga Salt Mine Project. While he was in Ithaca, Smithson placed mirrors in various outdoor situations and photographed them. And he also used mirrors and materials from some of those places, most notably salt crystals from an abandoned mine, to make a number of of gallery pieces, displaying them in company with some of the photographs and related documentary material. Here a map of the mirror trail. The gallery pieces went on to be remade and exhibited elsewhere in whole or partial reconstruction. Slant pieces, for example, um, currently exist most of the time as a bunch of salt crystals in a green plastic garbage can somewhere in the storage at Oberlin College Art Museum, and borrowers are sent the garbage can along with instructions about the size of the mirror to be bought. Some of the photographs appeared to function as documentation of otherwise fugitive works like the mirror trail. Some came to have an afterlife as Smithson photo works, and it's not entirely clear to me how that came about. So what kind of work or activity is this? What are even the right questions to ask about it? We're now so used to work of this general sort, one thing alongside another somewhere for a while, that it may be hard to feel these as pressing questions. They just, as, as it were, the shape of our maybe postmodern freedom from the various strictures that have hemmed in art for most of its history. In 1969, and for a good number of years after that, Figuring out the questions and finding answers to them seemed to exa be exactly what the work demanded. And it may be that it still is, both for its own sake and because of whatever part it may have played in making our current situation possible. In 1979, Rosalind Krauss produced a particularly interesting and influential account of work of this general kind. And in producing it, she was thinking not simply of Smithson, but of a whole group or generation of artists among whom Smithson was particularly salient. She takes it that by the late 1960s, for whatever reason, it had come to be important to sculpture, its practice and its understanding, that it was neither architecture nor landscape. And so one had to think about sculpture not in terms of some set of irreducible features that might be thought to constitute its inner core, but as a set of discrete possibilities structured by these apparently external relations to architecture and to landscape. In this expanded field, as she called it, um, the thing we were accustomed to call sculpture appears as simply one possibility. It's the one keyed, as it were, to its autonomy, to its being neither architecture nor landscape. Krauss lays the full field out as what she usually calls a Klein group, she also often referred to as a semiotic or a Gramassian square, and also recognizable as a version of our, the Aristotelian table of oppositions and contraries. And she argues that the work that interests her finds its sense within a system in which what she calls axiomatic structures, um, mark sites, site construction, and the things we have always called sculpture are held in tension with one another constituting a relational but not substantial whole. The Cayuga salt mine work can be laid out fairly nicely on her diagram, although it may feel like stretching to include the map of the mirror trail as answering to what she calls a process of mapping the axiomatic features of the architectural experience, the abstract conditions of openness and closure, onto a given space. Krauss's own examples in the say, include Smithson's 1970 partially buried woodshed as a site construction and the 1969 incidents of mirror travel in the Yucatan 
for marked sites. I wonder if a non-site gets any closer to what she means by axiomatic structures. Smithson certainly made works that look more axiomatic, but they seem less architecturally engaged and more nearly like a traditional sculpture. There is, of course, no compelling reason why we should expect Smithson to fill out all the positions in Krauss's expanded fields. He's trying to give a general account of what sculpture has become in the 70s. What we probably most want to hold on to out of the attempt to fit him into it is to see how comfortable his work seems in a relational field structured this way by opposition and negation. We might also want to take note of how near and how far Krauss's demonstration is to a certain kind of dialectical unfolding or proof of its object, sculpture making itself out of its systematic negations. We might also notice how near and again how far we are from a view of something like the system of the arts, architecture, sculpture, landscape, all forming a system that articulates itself. Um, and I'm going to pick up on those things in various ways as I go along. Krauss's own subsequent use of this Klein group follows a rather different track that is also, I think, interesting in thinking about Smithson. Having employed it, as we just saw, to make visible the expanded field of one medium, she goes on in her later work to use it to illustrate the internal exhaustion of another medium, painting. The structuring terms are significantly different, figure and ground taken as presumably irreducible dimensions of the visual. And the work of the analysis is to show that what has appeared to us is a modernist history, a certain kind of clarifying progress of history, sort of from cubism up through color field painting, is now visible as merely the repeated occupation of various positions within this structure. One assumes rightly enough that this is meant to set the stage for a claim about a certain postmodernism, something that follows from that exhaustion of the structure. But Krauss pushes this conclusion in a somewhat surprising direction, turning through the thought that the diagram itself, in all its transparency and clarity, doesn't escape the conditions it claims to lay bare. It, too, is something that shows. It's a figure against a ground. And it's no more able to account for its own visibility than the painting whose closure it charts. It's almost as if now she's suddenly turning around and reading her diagram through the painting, seeing it as a kind of instance of it. She continues this thought in ways I won't attempt to go into in any detail by playing the diagram itself against the Lacanian transformation of it that entails recognizing that the diagram's clarity is the effect of a mirror hidden within it and supported elsewhere. So in this diagram, you, in effect, are being asked to read the, label, the line that's labeled imaginary relation as the edge of a mirror plane. The actual argument is here more complex, so it's supported from underneath. But if you're looking from the upper left corner, you think you have a clear view. You don't see the mirror propped up in front of you. You just see the image. Um, the actual argument here is fairly complex, but it runs through these Lacanian diagrams in ways some of you may find interesting. This is all meant to map the structure of what she calls the optical unconscious, and it opens into her argument for a postmodernism that doesn't so much come after modernism as lurk within it as something like it's repressed, and so becoming visible in its rewriting. Krauss does not have Smithson explicitly on her mind here. He, in fact, figures nowhere in the optical unconscious. But I think it's useful for us. It's not just that mirrors are clearly a major resource for him in ways that we need to work through but also that there are significant reaches of his work that seem deeply interested either in what happens when the pictorial or its underlying conventions are realized as three-dimensional facts. Pointless vanishing point can stand in well enough for this line of work in Smithson as a whole, and that also seem deeply interested in the complex relation of surface and depth, reflection and transparency um, that's Amplified by, for example, the glass strata or the mirror strata pieces. Um, those letters on there are from a, a nearby Lawrence Wiener that's being reflected in it. 
<clears throat> of the mirrors as he used them at Cornell, Smithson said, this is one of the mirror pieces, I'm using a mirror because a mirror, in a sense, is both the physical mirror and the reflection. The mirror is concept and abstraction. Then the mirror is a fact within the mirror concept. Here, the sight non sight becomes encompassed by mirror as a concept, mirroring the mirror being a dialectic. I take that as saying roughly that what had once appeared to him as dialectical, that is, the relation between a sight and a non sight, the reference of a gallery piece to an external sight that is, in some sense, its source. Right, you see the map here the bin with the rocks from the site in it. Right? The refer reference of a gallery piece to an external site that is in some sense its source, but which is also the site it is only because it's picked out by the non-site in the gallery. All of this appears to him too simply built out of external relationships. So the use of a physical mirror within the site makes the division and relation on which this earlier worked turned enter into the site itself, makes it, as it were, its own non-site, um, caught in a reflection that then escapes it. The mirror, Smithson continues, is a displacement, an abstraction absorbing, reflecting the site in a very physical way. It's an addition to the site, but I don't leave the mirrors there. I pick them up. The photographed mirrors appearing on a gallery wall then extend and revise that dialectic still further, subsuming the mirror under the photograph just as the mirror subsumed the non-site, even as the gallery non-site pieces with their mirrors show themselves as displacements of their own sight. There on the walls, some of the documentation where the map is and so on. The photographed mirrors appearing on a gallery wall then extend and revise that dialectic still further. I said that. Incidents of the mirror travel in the Yucatan takes this thinking as far as Smithson ever takes it. A car full of texts, notably including John Stevens' 1843 book, Incidents of Travel in the Yucatan, as it were, underwrites Smithson's trip to Mexico, where he proceeds to place mirrors at a number of sites, photograph those mirrors in each of their sites, and then takes those photographs up into a text entitled Incidents of Mirror Travel in the Yucatan. That is, in the end, all there is of the piece. And it understands itself explicitly as the last in a chain of displacements of nature into mirror, mirrored nature into photograph, photographed mirror into text, and into text which knows itself to be a displacement also of the initial text or text, John Stevens' Incidents of Travel in the Yucatan, that set the whole chain of incidents into motion. Hegel's account of art can seem to press fairly close here. It's an account, that is, of thought finding itself at odds with its embeddedness in the arbitrary matter of language, and thus obliged to work through that materiality as architecture, as sculpture, as painting, and music, and poetry, in order to finally achieve genuine peace with itself. But of course, with Smithson, things never quite close round that way. One of Hegel's favorite images of dialectic is of a circular movement in which things return always at a higher level. As if Smithson's 1969 essay were the dialectical sublation, aufhebung, or relief of Stevens's 1843 book, right? returned at a higher level. But Smithson's spirals typically don't close on themselves that way. They turn instead variously in or away from themselves. In Spiral Jetty, this is visible as its lateral spread, and it's also invisible as as the movement that carries the structure of the salt crystals themselves spirals up through the jetty and into the path of the helicopter from which Smithson then films it. So it has its the overt land spiral and then the spiral that is at the micro level, the salt crystals, and above it the flight path of the helicopter filming it. In general, displacement seems to me a better word for what's going on here than dialectic. And you see this, for example, 
example, in the ways in which pieces like gyrostasis or shift are built as displacements of an element. Displacement is, in a strong sense, the actual substance and logic of Smithson's work. It's tempting to say that it's medium, that it's its medium, but that would be to mistake a mechanism or automatism, as Krauss, picking up on some remarks by Stanley Cavell, will come to put it, for a medium. So one might say, for example, that pouring is the mechanism or automatism through which Morris Lewis engages or discovers his medium, painting. And displacement would likewise be the mechanism through which Smithson engages or discovers his. What makes completing that sentence difficult is that what Smithson seems to engage is no one medium in particular but something like the fact of medium or mediums as such. This appears linked to the way the work makes itself at every level out of relation. It doesn't happen except by happening as, where the as signals always a displacement apart from which the work would collapse into nothing in particular. For example, some mirrors that were once in Mexico or in New York. In Ithaca and elsewhere, Smithson displaced things, and that mattered to him because he took it that things were only ever in displacement. We can, as we move across the range of his work, tell this is a story about the depth of language or textuality, as, for example, in the incidents of mirror travel, or in his heap of language, a piece that inflects our sense of the interest he takes in glass and mirror strata and what is possible for them, or as a story about the fate and conditions of visuality, as in the site non-site works or the more straightforward glass strata, but also as in the early and critical sort of pseudo-false minimalism of pieces like, like Alogon. In each instance, we're going to be telling some sort of story about how, for Smithson, there is no presence except on the condition of its own displacement, no presentation not already unfolded in representation, and so also no medium that doesn't already surpass itself. We've seen Krauss's diagrams. Here's Smithson's, worked out during the course of an interview in 1969. Both in its ground and its figures, it draws prominently on the repertoire of shapes I suggested back in the very first lecture were more or less native to Hegelian thought. But they are far from forming a systematic whole. They scatter across a field whose axes are curiously skewed and which is also heavily populated by marks of repetition as well as various amorphous shapes. And it's probably worth noticing that unlike most diagrams, it's far from visually flat. There are at least three horizon lines indicated on it. The downhill spill of poor, the submerged depth of Gondwana land, all rippling and bending its surface. And then there are two non-site trails with their imposed implicit slopes, mirroring each other even as they also repeat and underline the diagram's angular axes. At the polar coordinate system's origin, Smithson has written air terminal, which can be taken to refer to a number of possible designs developed in 1966 and 1967 for the Dallas-Fort Worth airport, including this flat model of an aerial view made from mirror triangles. How do we begin to sort out the play of surface and depth, pictorial and plastic, aerial and perspectival, spatial and temporal at work here? We might begin, as Smithson himself did, from painting and Hegel's particular claims for it. If sculpture is the practice through which art most nearly proves itself come closest to its actual autonomy and objectivity, then painting is what most nearly undoes that claim to autonomy. It's the art that most fully acknowledges what must escape it, and so painting's moment of primacy occurs as a retreat from the claims of sculpture, a withdrawal from three-dimensional presence into a two-dimensional practice predicated on the absence or the unavailability to painting 
of its own deepest thoughts and aspirations. Because the moment of painting's primacy is the moment of art's finitude and its turning toward its dissolution as philosophy, painting's primacy in its moment is itself limited. It knows as part of its condition, a part of its withdrawal, that it is one art among other arts. This is what it means that in modernity the individual arts take on the shape of mediums, assume their necessary finitude, and so this moment is for Hegel the coming into visibility of the dialectical whole that is the system of the arts. I want to say that Smithson knows all of this in his bones, that he makes his art out of this kind of fact. That he knows that art is now obliged to prove itself in and as its own dispersion. That to be a work of art, to sustain itself in that place, entails a work of displacement that amounts to being responsible for its appearance, always in and as a working of, a sis of system and relation, such that the very terms that grant it visibility as sculpture or as painting or as anything else um, bind it always to another art. This would be to say that the question of medium is not simply set aside for Smithson in the wake of minimalism, that taking the effect of minimalism to be a direct giving of open permission for whatever, for the unarguable validity of any form of installation or placement, is too easy. Smithson does not make what Thierry de Duve calls art in general. He makes what I'd call art as such which is to say that in his work, the question of medium continues to be a serious one. But the condition of that question has been profoundly changed. The work is now bound to assume it without being able to claim any support that would rely on the solidity of a discrete self-supporting medium and without being able to locate itself with reference to some stable system through which the arts articulate themselves in advance of the works that would then simply answer to it. Instead, the work just is the realized responsibility for, say, the proving of these things, thus becomes explicitly responsible not simply for its medium, but for what in that medium both divides and exceeds it, continuously opening it to displacement. I've been focusing so far on painting's moment of logical primacy that is, on how the multiplicity of arts is transformed when painting becomes the subject of the sentences written in art's name. The word moment is a physical metaphor of sorts for Hegel, and he frequently glosses it by appealing to the model of a lever in which mass and distance jointly determine the lever's work. As if in terms of one of the examples from the first lecture, God is being, right? God and being were balanced on the point of their identity. The copula is their fulcrum, and as if reading the proposition, putting it to work, amounted to finding the various ways in which mass and distance, God and being, might be distributed and redistributed either side of that fulcrum. Hegel's second example in that same passage, which was the actual is the universal, most likely gets heard slightly differently. We can pretty easily hear God as being is being as offering a timeless kind of truth, even if it takes us a bit of time to read. And so reading it can feel like securing that timelessness. The actual is the universal is less likely to strike us as timeless that way. And we are correspondingly more likely to recognize that its reading and the time that reading takes might be internally related to its actual sense, so that one dimension of the proposition's proof would be broadly historical. To say that the actual is the universal involves showing that the actual has become the universal. Something of this aspect of Hegelian argument is signaled by the frequency with which the word vanishing shows up as a modifier throughout Hegel's writings. In particular, any given subject, in the sense I've been exploring it, is repeatedly, Hegel says, only as a vanishing moment. It is the subject, and then it ceases to be the subject as something else becomes the subject. The core grammar there, the subject is repeatedly only as, marks the grammatical revision or complication proper to the speculative proposition. Every sentence produces another sentence in such a way that the overall structure of argument assumes the shape of the spiral. <clears throat> 
So the claims I've been making about painting in relation to the system, the mutual adjacency of the multiple arts, are also historical claims. Painting's moment of primacy, or more accurately, partial primacy, is the one Hegel broadly distinguishes as romantic and which is easier for us to call modern. And a signal feature of this moment is that it knows itself in a way neither the symbolic nor the classical do as historical, as having history as part of how it works and means. As Nancy puts it of the Hegel that he calls the inaugural thinker of the contemporary world, Hegel is the witness of the world's entry into a history in which it is no longer just a matter of changing form, of replacing one vision in one order by some other vision in some other order, but in which the one and only point of view and of order is that of transformation itself. It's thus not a point. It is the passage, the negativity in which the cutting edge of sense gets experienced as never before. So displacement is a temporal as well as spatial term, and using it of Smithson must mean to register not only the way the work unfolds across a certain dispersion of the arts or mediums, but the way in which temporality is internal to it, a part of what it thinks. Art, Smithson writes in the text of the seventh mirror displacement, brings sight to a halt, but that halt has a way of unraveling. And in taking on this sentence, one might think of the ways in which the placing of mirrors within a landscape first interrupts the visual, visual continuity of that landscape, and then itself becomes part of it. Or of the way in which the photographing of those mirrors freezes what flickers across them before giving way in its turn to the movement now renewed as text in the incidents of mirror tra travel. As the fourth displacement puts it, <coughs> jade-colored jade water splashed near the mirrors, which were supported by dry seaweed and eroded rocks. But the reflections abolished the supports, and now words abolished the reflections. The unnameable tonalities of blue that were once square tide pools of sky have vanished into the camera and now rest in the cemetery of the printed page, Ancora in Arcadia Morte. That last phrase is difficult. Ancora literally means anchor, and it figuratively extends to take in support, refuge, hope. So one might say that its emergence at the end of the passage is determined first by the appearance of the mirror's support, their anchorage, if you will, in the landscape, and then by the reflections showing themselves to be essentially unsupported, thus exposed and without refuge. But of course, this will only make sense, will only be legible, will only be a way of reading this passage if Smithson's vision has already been given over to Poussin's paintings, the tomb and its inscriptions, which perhaps along with the blue of the later version, Sky, are at once unraveled and brought again to a halt in it, even as that halt itself is already unraveling. Taking time as one of its necessary dimensions, Smithson's work makes claims on the time, the history, in which it figures. And if the pair on the screen now is not the kind of thing one standardly sees in the art history classroom, it's nonetheless a thought about the shape of art's history, whose terms are not entirely without precedent. Fulflin, for example, famously writes that vision itself has its history, and the revelation of those visual strata must be regarded as the primary task of art history, just as he also writes that the content of the world does not crystallize for the beholder into an unchanging form. Or to return to the first metaphor, beholding is just not a mirror which always remains the same, but a living apprehension which has its own inward history and has passed through many stages. What's shared here between Smithson and Volflin is at least a range of figures, strata, crystal, mirror. And so perhaps whatever historical force we can imagine those kinds of terms to carry, a force that will, at least on the face of it, not be primarily a matter of human agency. The spiral would be another figure Volflin and Smithson share. For Volflin, 
As for Hegel, who's clearly a major presence for Wolfland, this is the shape of our historical periodicity. And I think we've already seen enough to know that it's certainly one of the ways Smithson imagines and thinks through time. Smithson's work and writing seem to me to evidence a number of fairly distinct ways of imagining time. There are, for example, the repeated appeals to entropy. Oh, that's the spiral. Here's entropy. Which is in physics what counts as the actual arrow of time. Scientific materials form the largest single element of Smithson's library as we now know it. And it's a pretty sophisticated bunch of readings, particularly in the areas of geology and crystallography, but also, for example, including mathematicians like Cantor and Dedekind. He was a serious dabbler in this stuff. The notion of entropy is itself difficult. It has both a thermodynamic sense and a sense in information theory, and at least as nearly as I can figure out, the relations between those two senses are not wholly resolved. Smithson knew both sides of that and worried about their relation, or at their relation. Although it's easy enough to take entropy as meaning either that order gives way to disorder or that things just plain wind down, it's wrong to think of entropy as a synonym of support sorts for chaos or heterogeneity. It names an equilibrium arising not out of things counterpoised to one another, but made out of complete indifference. And our ordinary construals of order and disorder can lead us astray at times. A phase change from water to ice, which looks from a certain angle like an increase in order, leads nonetheless in direction of greater entropy. Crystallization is evidently a special problem in entropy. It's tempting to look at Smithson's various poor pieces and see them as especially oriented towards entropy because of the disorderly running down of the glue or asphalt, and so to oppose them to what appears as sharply crystalline elsewhere in his work. But that's to forget that both glue and asphalt will harden when they've been poured, and that too is entropic work. There have been a number of attempts to place entropy at the center of Smithson's work, and I'm not sure that any of them make really usable sense. I tend to see the interest in entropy as more the statement of a problem that his other imaginations of time sort of take up and work over. <laughs> then there is, and the historian Jennifer Roberts has done a nice job of picking out and insisting on this, what I'll call the enantiomorphic figure of time. The thought begins here with the 1965 enantiomorphic chambers a sort of perverse stereoscope in which the two eyes, what the two eyes are given to see in the mirrors left and right leads not to a fully realized and unified central illusion, but to, to its presumably distinct absence, the two images not fusing but canceling one another out. The temporal analog of this that clearly much interested Smithson would be a four-dimensional object in which future and past stood to one another as the chamber's two oblique mirrors, canceling out the present and producing a void in its place. Smithson's first major travelogue piece, A Tour of the Monuments of Passaic, New Jersey, draws strongly on this intuition. Skimming, we read, since it was Saturday, many machines were not working, and this caused them to resemble prehistoric creatures trapped in the mud, or better, extinct machines, mechanical dinosaurs stripped of their skin. On the edge of this prehistoric machine age were pre- and post-World War II suburban houses. The houses mirrored themselves into colorness, colorlessness. Again, that zero panorama seemed to contain ruins in reverse, that is, all the new construction that would be eventually built. This is the opposite of the romantic ruin because the buildings don't fall into ruin after they are built, but rather rise into ruins before they are built. Again, I walked down a parking lot that covered the railroad, the old railroad tracks, which at one time ran through the middle of Passaic. The monumental parking lot divided the city in half, turning it into a mirror and a reflection but the mirror kept changing places with the reflection. Passaic, Smithson writes, 
was a typical abyss or ordinary void. But then he also asks, has Passaic replaced Rome as the eternal city? Each city would be a three-dimensional mirror that would reflect the next city into existence. The enantiomorphic evacuation of the present apparently reverses itself here into an image of eternity, as if the ultimate lesson of the temporal chamber built of past and future were that the whole apparatus amounted to a crystal block in which the words before and after were stripped of all purchase. In Passaic, there is no arrow of time. The last of the monuments, the Sandbox Monument, also called the Desert, appears as at once confirming and dissolving the double truth of Passaic. He writes, every grain of sand was a dead metaphor that equaled timeless, and to decipher such metaphors would take one through the false mirror of eternity. The sandbox in, the, in its place in the monuments is, appears as the hard, dry truth of the watery monuments that precede it. And with it before him, Smithson's tone in the writing shifts. The person who has been speaking to no one except himself turns towards a reader and attempts a proof of what he calls the irreversibility of eternity by taking the sandbox up as a simple illustration of entropy that's meant to convince us or him that time's having an arrow and it's not having an arrow come to the same thing. It all turns on circular movement, he writes. Picture in your mind's eye the sandbox divided in half with black sand on one side and white sand on the other. We take a child and have him run hundreds of times clockwise in the box until the sand gets mixed and begins to turn gray. After that, we have him run anti-clockwise, but the result will not be a restoration of the original division, but a greater degree of grayness and an increase of entropy. It's a nice bit of writing in the use of the words clockwise and anti-clockwise, and it is, I think, particularly clever. But it doesn't work, even for him. So there's another paragraph where we ask to imagine filming all this and then running the film backwards. Film itself is on its reel yet another spiral. That's a part of how it figures in the displacements of Spiral Jetty. And then we, the readers, get reminded that the film itself will eventually crumble. The essay peters out like some of Holderland's late poems. It's thought baffled and unachieved. A third image of time that runs through Smithson is geological, and it's deeply embedded in his materials. It's above all a thought of stratification, of the material depth of things as the actual fact or deposit of time, and of maps as the surfacings of such time as line and grid and writing. It's almost impossible to pick up anything of Smithson's without finding it at work one way or another. Leaning strata looks and sounds like some peculiar geological formation, and may, we may as well say that it is that, but it's also just perceptually odd enough that we won't be particularly surprised to discover that it, like Pointless Vanishing Point, is a partial three-dimensional materialization of a perspective recession. Geology is in Smith's an irregular point of passage between two and three dimensions. It captures the expression of time as surface, as what is productive of marks of stratification or flow, crystallization and dislocation, as well as that into which any imposed marks ultimately sink. Buildings become geology. Airports for Smithson already are geology. And the earth seen from the air, oops, passage between two and three dimensions. The Earth seen from the air, just some slides I took off of Google, is at once flat or flattened and visibly answerable to, shaped by, and expressive of both its inhabitation and its beneaths. Geological time is not human time. Its essential range is the prehistoric and the posthistoric, but it is nonetheless epical, at once continuous and discrete, fractured, folded, compounded, surfaces write their own histories, as in the Mud Project, another version of the Sandbox Monument, its only text, 
One, dig up 100 foot square area with a pitchfork. Two, get local fire department to fill area with water. A fire hose may be used for this purpose. Three, the area will be finished when it turns to mud. Four, let it dry under the sun until it turns to clay. Five, repeat process at will. The accompanying illustration is of Walter de Maria's half mile long drawing. And he says, de Maria's parallel chalk lines are 12 feet apart and run half a mile along the dry lake of El Mirage in the Mojave Desert. The dry mud under these lines is cracking into an infinite variety of polygons. As one pushes into this dimension of Smithson's work and writing, new pieces come more distinctly into view. The various islands and maps proposed or executed in broken glass, Atlantis, for example, or the extraordinary play of photograph, mirror, and geological strata in six stops on a section, or the stratified refuge, seven stops on a section, six stops on a section, right, six stops, two close-ups, or the stratified refuse of line of wreckage, or the hybrid text strata, a geophotographic fiction, in which Smithson writes a complex jumble of description, citation, and artistic proposal between reproduced fossil strata. We work our way backwards to the Precambrian where we find Ruskin saying, if only the geologists would let me alone, I could do very well with those dreadful hammers. These periods, then, are not exactly as the natural historian or the geologist takes them, but as they are reworked by the writing Smithson variously recognizes or inserts within them. And if they are neither scaled to nor answerable to the time of the thoughts and actions we can call our own, they're also never devoid of that which articulates us, which means that what several lectures ago I spoke of as this time becomes complicated, fractured, not simply or wholly ours. What is prehistoric in Smithson is never mute, inarticulate, and self-enclosed nature, but already ruins of writings, of cities, of monumentality. Smithson's proposed museum of language in the vicinity of art is, among other things, a sort of rearticulation and complication of the hinge between the museums of art and of natural history as they are already in place. It's a place where the communication between Smithson's directly visual and his more writerly interest becomes notably thick and complex. So it seems to me these three models or imaginations repeatedly tangle with one another in Smithson's work. And there are a variety of both forms and materials that act as relays in that entanglement. The obvious question is what all this adds up to. And it's clear enough both that Smithson very much dreams of some sum they might form and that it repeatedly falls apart in his hands, as, for example, in the tour of Passaic. It seems to me we can think of what Smithson's doing here as working his way through three different but closely related things. The first, the one borne by the stake in entropy, is simply that there is time. It's captured well enough by one of Aristotle's simple and stunning remarks that when we can say before and after, then we have time. A different stretch of Aristotle seems to me to capture the stakes of the anantiomorphic imagination. We have plot when we find ourselves putting our time words to work in particular ways to to pick out things called beginnings, before which there is nothing, middles, which have something before and something after, and ends after which there is nothing. The anantiomorphic chamber is perhaps the best understood as a machine for thinking plot, or more broadly, composition, against itself. And of course, these first two, time and plot, will not add up because work, even as we build it out of time, is a struggle against time and dreams of separation from it. And Smithson participates in that dream. The geological strand seems to me to think something still further. 
something that cannot be fully parsed by before and after, nor brought directly into the shape of a plot, because what geology insists on are those facts for which our only adequate tenses are those called, one way or another, perfect. Future perfect, pluperfect, the simple completed past that we also call perfect. Times that we can, as it were, speak, but we can't actually touch. There are, these are, for a grammarian, not matters finally of tense, but of what's called aspect. Languages can establish various kinds of relation or distance between tense and aspect. Indo-European languages, I'm told, typically run them together where other languages may more sharply distinguish them. English is apparently particularly casual about running together past tense plus perfective and a past prior to another past. The latter, past prior to another past, puts things in appropriate sequence, while the former picks out something past in its completedness. So standard examples would be, after I had eaten, I went. Right? Um, one past thing before another, as opposed to because I had eaten, which locates a perfect act in the past in its completedness. Aspect and tense taken together yield a grammar of the event. They map out the space of history. I think each taken simply by itself gives you myth or chronicle, but doesn't give you what we call history. Caught then between time and composition, caught, one might say, in decomposition, Smithson's work repeatedly works through the grammar of its history as the actual material of its making. That's to say that for Smithson, art is essentially historical and does not simply find itself in history it doesn't find itself in a period, but is itself periodic. There's a way of accepting this as something like a belief Smithson holds about time and illustrates or expresses in his art, something like the content of his art. That seems to me to fall short both of adequate description of it and adequate grasp of its actual claims on the history of art. So it may help here to haul Wolfsland back up in his odd proximity to Smithson. If one tracks for something more than an example, um, Albrecht Dürer's appearances through Wolfsland's principles, you find him appearing sometimes as classical and sometimes as Baroque. This is presumably because the terms classical and Baroque finally don't name discrete stretches of time in which a work is to be definitively located, but instead index aspects of a temporality bound up with a work's appearing as art. Durer's art, or any art of the kind Wolflin is concerned with, is essentially historical and periodic. And this means there are no fixed terms for its description. Nothing, one might say, that counts permanently as the terms of its composition. Here, for example, Durer's work is painterly and recessive and all of that, and here again, but now it's switched its place. It's now linear and planar and all of that. But Wolflin both names and fails to render fully explicit, but that Smithson insists on absolutely, is first that the unfolding periodicity of classical and Baroque both depends upon and continually produces something Wolflin calls primitive and which Smithson registers as prehistoric. And second, that this means that the object at issue, which one will have every reason to call art, is always necessarily also later art, which is indeed the subtitle of Wolfson's Principles of Art History, the question of style in later art. So art is its own belatedness. You might imagine this as the bite of the future perfect into its present. It makes art at every moment also a thing of the past. One can feel, in a way I think quite foreign to Wolflin, the enantiomorphic pushing its way up here, as if the classic were only ever to cancel itself out in Smithson's mirrors. <coughs> itself, I'm missing a slide there, is the movement at once forward and circular of Hegelian argument and text. As the subject gets displaced through its predicate and becomes another subject, the argument marks itself off 
in shapes and periods. The slide that dropped out here, see, think of a sort of wheel turning around itself on a track, and it's going to mark off, and you put a dab of paint on the wheel at one point. As it turns, it's going to mark periods off on that line. That's Hegelian, Smithsonian kind of periodicity, the spiral that marks itself off in segments. That is, for Hegel, what it is that there is history. Art's history, while it lasts, is the thinking that unfolds as thoughts turn themselves through their material conditions and is thus permanently bound up with the possibilities of the individual arts and of the imagination of art as a whole born by them. The art Hegel picks out as of our time, romantic or modern, is importantly conditioned by its dispersion into explicit discrete mediums oriented to finitude and forming a system that can no longer claim to do the central work of sculpture in its classical moment. Its belatedness is at once distinct and inseparable from the earliness of the symbolic or primitive or prehistoric that is both its perfect past and its dialectical rhyme and for which the truth of art as a whole is simply that there is one thing after another. Smithson's art has as its element the deep plotlessness of art's time as it surfaces through or rubs against a presence stretched between incipience and end given over to periodicity. It seems to me this has been a kind of complicated talk. It is simply supposed to be a description of Smithson's work. I think a part of what makes this particular talk difficult is that we've come to think of the space of time the term period picks out as having the shape of, and Arthur Danto puts this very nicely, a cultural whole. Right? So 17th century art is art that picks out 17th century culture as its container. This is a major consequence of Panofsky's fundamental reworking of art history around the classical. It's a reworking that leaves the word history in the name of the discipline, but fundamentally turns it into anthropology. We look at history and we see cultures and we analyze them. We can't get Smithson's work right within that frame because it's a direct challenge to it. What Smithson both courts and fears is something you might call the grammar death of art. Thank you. I'm happy to entertain questions. Uh, yeah. Thank you. This is still a lot of questions for the board. Writing something about Smithson himself and um, there's a paper about it this year. And um, I just, it, I was trying to uh, work out uh, what you were saying, kind of overlap to what I trying to do and worry about him. And um, it seems to me that the Smithian painting is still sort of bound up with a kind of Western tradition, stretching back through Romanticism to Classicism, um, and where it kind of reaches into the prehistoric the primitive, that's where it sort of escapes that particularity, if you see what I mean. Um, what I'm interested in, what I'm trying to write about, I think, is where Smithson refers to Native America, Native American culture, um, which I haven't really researched there yet. I've been using Australian Aboriginal culture as a sort of cipher and looking there and finding that Aboriginal Australians didn't have the word before or after and now and then. In fact, 
and I think a hundred dialects that may work at the time. And we had this wonderful different and uh, kind of impossible uncertainty for the dreaming. But we try and actually get to that anyway. Um, but I've got a feeling that there may be some similar uncertainty in the American culture that seems to uh, somehow take it into, but that's something I want to research more. Um, so just adding on to that, um, I was also thinking about the way the entropic pieces, like the pores and rundowns, um, refer to a kind of what you might call a kind of ungrammatical formula stance. Say it to us, but again. An ungrammatical formula stance um, that maybe Krauss actually picked up on later by moving into the formulas with that tie to the kind of Nietzschean, uh, something Nietzschean as well, this kind of inference of the tie on Krauss at that point, etc. Um, and thinking about the way that Nietzsche disparaged grammar, that uh, Nietzsche thought that grammar was a kind of prison. For us, a kind of God that we excluded the free of, but that's the God we can't get free of, the God of grammar. Um, so, I don't know my, my question is exactly, but I just sort of wanted to map that sort of area that I thought was maybe on the margin or slightly outside of your lecture and see what you thought of that sort of series of connections. Yeah, so sort of three connections. One question about movement beyond Western culture to right. places where time is imagined differently. Or, or, right. time, I mean, or not imagined at all, or yeah, whatever we want to say there. I, mean, I guess it's just, I, suspect, I get the sense that Aboriginal Australian culture exists without meaning the concept of time. time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, then, and, then, and then the and then the, yeah. and then, and then the sort of, of um, Formlessness by Thai reference. Yeah, anyway, Nietzsche, that's how it's really going to be as a sort of structure. Yeah. And then Nietzsche on, on grammar. So I'll try and take each okay. of those briefly. Um, <clears throat> I don't think Smithson is deeply interested in questions of culture in at any level. It's, it's not something he thinks about. Um, and I draw, obviously, a pretty sharp distinction between the historical and the cultural in this lecture. And I see Smithson as someone who is tremendously interested in questions about time, the registration of time, history, the internality of time to making work, and how to think that through. Um, so I, I, I have nothing to say about dream time and things like that. I don't think it's a stake for him. And I think it's important that the prehistoric for him is, above all, always it's it's... It's geological, it's pre-human, that's where he's going to. He's not going to other cultures, he's going out of the place we know how to narrate to another place um, that is, in the grammatical aspectual sense, perfect. Right? Um, so that's part of my answer. Um, there are certainly accounts of Smithson that place things like Bataille and formlessness very much at the center, including Krauss at certain points, and Gary Shapiro's work on Smithson goes this way as well. Um, and I guess I'm simply at odds with that account. I don't see that as, as the center of Smithson's work. Um, the Nietzsche question is, is tough and interesting, and it gets partly into arguments about Nietzsche as well. Um, but I take grammar as seriously as Nietzsche does. And I think Smithson takes grammar seriously. I mean, it's it's, it's an, a consequential feature of how he thinks about work, how he writes, and so on. Um, and it only fully, as it were, comes out when he thinks about geology. That's when the grammar of things is what is to be dealt with, as opposed to the entropic thought, which is, I think, simply an imagination of time. And the anandiomorphic one, which I think is, is kind of the pivot between the two thoughts, but it is a thought about beginnings, middles, and ends, and how they do or do not fit together, and composition and so on. Um, so I don't know if I fully answered your question, but certainly all the parts of your questions enter into people's accounts of Smithson's. Um, and the weight of mine comes down on the grammatical bit. 
that's what I think counts as missing, and, and I think it's deeply tied to the geological, what I'm calling the geological imagination. I wonder if you could just say a little bit more about um, the kind of bridge and point of difference between Smithson's um, pleas to one side and pleas to the other, which seems, which is often seen as kind of the foundation of documents of um, art history and you can kind of say that the works are done, but you see, of course, you have a series of containers and so on. Elaborate a little bit about how that is emerging in, in, in the 1960s through the Smithsons work, for example. How, say the last part again. Um, you know, the context out of which it, it's emerging that um, Smithsons under all of this periodicity that um, <coughs> has been associated with the same philosophy. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think I'll take that in, in two steps. Um, the first is, I think it is a, a sort of inevitable general consequence of the way I approach this stuff. Panofsky's art history emerges in the shape that it does as a way of, and he's fairly explicit about this, and Gombrich is even more so subsequent, putting an end to Hegelian kinds of art history. So you might say, I'm already at odds with Panofskyan art history leaving Smithson aside. Um, and one can discuss these claims about what it takes to, um, to give an account that is historical. Panofsky's understanding of that, the Hegelian one, and I'm pushing the Hegelian one, where an, histor an account is historical when it's dialectical, when the subject is at stake. And for Panofsky, the subject is never at stake. Um, and history is the segmentation of time into things that have the unities we associate with the culture. Right? That's why you can get the great Panofskian accounts of sort of the Gothic cathedral and the philosophic summa and so on as, as manifesting a cultural whole, which is followed by another cultural whole. Right? So that's, that's that tension. Smithson's context is, is one of those sort of tough questions. I mean, I think that the honest answer to it is Smithson's context is some combination of immediate artistic facts, minimalism, the arguments around it, and let's say his library. Um, and the library shows an imagination that is moving in a number of different directions. He's clearly interested in, for example, and this comes back a little to this earlier question, he's interested in and reading about, um, he's reading Levi Strauss. He's a very early reader of Levi Strauss. He's reading Eliade. He's interested in other conceptions of time. He is interested in that material, and he's reading that. Um, he's reading around in philosophy fairly widely. Um, he's reading Kubler, is important then. Right? Um, so you might say he's got various things that are helping him extend a question of time in ways that matter to him. It's me bringing out the anti panofskian implications of that. Um, he is reading some in art history. Um, Wolfland doesn't emerge for him much as a name. I don't think Panofsky does either much. But of course, that pair from Poussin is one Panofsky has spent a fair amount of time on. Um, <coughs> who does figure for him? Mannerism? The question of what mannerism is for him. So, so pursuing that sort of the art historical, direct art historical interest we know Smithson to have had is, I guess, one better way to answer your question. I'm not really ready to go there. Is that fair enough? Another just quick question, because this diagram you have um, I'm, I'm because we're recording this. I'm not allowed to go back in the slides. 
Um, it, was, it, was, it was the kind of net um, drawing that you said that you believe your energy. Oh, that, yes. Um, um, you can find that a couple of places. The easiest place, but not in a terribly good reproduction, is, I think, in the collected writings, um, in the, the newest edition of it. Um, it is also used as the cover and much better reproduced in one of the more recent um, retrospectives, and maybe somebody else can remember better which one it is. Um, but it is, I mean, it's, it is... You know, an elaborate doodle. Um, is there any commentary on that? Is it what? Is there any kind of commentary on that? The commentary is the interview in a way, or it's it's the commentary on the interview, right? So one way to read it is to sort of read the interview and imagine Smithson pointing to and elaborating on things. Um, because of the way the lecture was set up, I take it as a a straight diagram and just try and focus on its features. But it's it's some. Um, Kind of endlessly fascinating. I can spend a lot of time. Martin. Uh, thanks, Ian, for the very interesting talk. And um, I wonder if there was some, you made a distinction or some point between art in general and art as such. Yeah. And I wondered what the stakes, if, 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 if that distinction could be thought, thought through as having different stakes or grammar. Or the grammatical implications of either of those. Yeah, those I, 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 right offhand, and maybe you can push me more about it, but art in general, as to do speaks of it, seems to be the fact that you don't have to make anything in particular. In particular, you don't have to be answerable to anything like a medium. That is, you know, used to be once upon a time, if you said you were an artist, someone would say to you, would, be, would feel entitled to say, oh, do you paint or do you sculpt? Right? And the Duke thinks that question no longer is even askable. Right? It's enough to be an artist. Art as such is a bit of a fudge word, but it's one that you need for Smithson. Right? The claim that he is still interested in medium. He's still interested in the sense that to make a something is to make something that displaces itself systematically. So, yeah, there's no good answer to the question, are you a painter or are you a sculptor? But you're not free of it either. You're still responsible to the discreteness of the makings. Right? Um, the word practice, in a way, emerges here as a way of, of addressing whatever that change is fairly enough. To say art as such is, as I'm using it, to mean something that comes discreetly, in medium-like shapes. And one is still responsible for that, answerable to it, if you want. That's the distinction I'm trying to make. Is that? Uh, yes, I'm just wondering what, what, what you, I mean, in terms of grammar, how would that be, those two positions be oh, thought through? Um, basically, the, the, my position and now I'm, I'm not going to stick Hegel with this, although I, I think if he were persuaded, he would have to, um, is that art in general lacks grammar completely. Art as such is a grammatical exercise. And that's why I say Smith's in courts and fears the grammar death of art. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Just following on from that, um, um, with Sarah and, uh, and Hesse, um, the problems they have, the distinctions they have with minimalism, and the sense of the way one thing coming up from another is the minimalist time frame that she found was antagonistic to. Would you say that that is um, a grammatical as well, or is it like M minimalism? Yeah. Would yeah. That, would that, yeah. That fall into that category. Yeah. Yeah. So is there, is there kind of opposite, the opposition to that? Do you, do you, I mean, especially with things like um, 
periods, periods we talked about before. You get a sense if you had a sense not just that it was bad on the matter at all, things like that, but what type of time was minimalism perhaps um, posing to somebody like Sarah or Hess or more specifically Smith's? Smith and he felt he kind of crossed in his opposition to minimalism and its pushed to the right. It's, it's, a, it's a nice question. I'll, I'll try a couple of things that won't quite amount to an answer. Um, on the one hand, in thinking about the way these lectures have developed, and particularly this sort of center of them, which is clearly the Sarah Hess Smiths, and that's the 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 engine of these things in some ways. Um, for Sarah and Hess, it is easy to build into the account of them a fairly direct critique of minimalism. That came across rather strongly. And it'll come up again sort of surprisingly around Eisenman next week. But always in the background is a worry about something that is sometimes called architecture and is sometimes called one thing after another. Right? And that's something I've got to deliver on next week. Which you might say was, was this talk, it's the one thing after another worry that is, is pressing close on Smithson. And the sense of a direct critique of minimalism simply in the lecture is not there in the same way. Um, and I do think that's because Smithson's position here is a little more oblique, partly because I was still able to give an account of Sarah and Hess as persons engaged in something like a medium, very strongly in Sarah's case, in a more attenuated way in, in, in Hess's case. Um, I do think the time thing is probably the crucial thing here. So that partly what one's asking about is the relation between, let's say, Freed's very interesting use of time in his account of what's wrong with minimalism, right? which is whatever you want to say about that, it ends him up having to make a distinction between presence and presentness that even he knows is, if not untenable, at least he hasn't really delivered it. Right? So I might say he's picked out a trouble with time that fits there. Right? Is that? Then you look at Smithson, who was the first acutely savage reader of art and objecthood. Um, and his response to it is really quite sharp and stunning in the letter that he writes to Art Forum. And then it is also sort of reworked more obliquely in his actual account of Tony Smith in um, oh, Sedimentation of Mind. Right? See, and, and that, you may recall, the letter is all about Freed being his own mirror, right? You might say the, the argument of it is, is coming out of the anti-amorphic stuff so you'd want to weigh that in there, too. That's the way I would, if you want to sort of say, what is Smithson's critique of minimalism? I'm going to say something like, it's in the imagination of time as it gets worked through all that stuff. Is that, is that, that's his... Yeah. yeah. Do, do you think that our object was um, Smithson's big prompt to think about that? Was what? So, do, do you think that our object no. No, I think I think I think Smithson's quickness in responding to art objects is, is a symptom of his already having these worries. And then I this is this would be to take a different track through the work than the one I took. But we'd go back to the early quasi-minimalist pieces, which I showed a couple of the Logan but also the, the mirror vortices 
and think about them as temporalizations of Judd through this kind of crystalline imagination and, and, and I guess spin them out that way. I mean, it's not an account I've tried to give, but I think that's, that's how it would go. Okay, so you preempted the question because um, I read that letter yesterday, and as you were speaking, I remembered how much uh, time was a concern in, in, in it in his part of his critique. Great. So maybe just to swing it back once again to um, Fried's conception of pleasantness. Um, could you could you just elaborate a little bit more on? Um, Smithsons. So you talk about three different concepts of time, so for Smithsons. Um, how does Freud's concept of presence, which I still don't think I really understand, even though I've read it a lot, um, why do they not fit together at all? Why do Freud and Smithson not fit together at all? Why, why, would, why would Smithson reject it so, so vehemently? Um, another nice question. Um, Let's see if it works this way. If you strip art and objecthood down to its imagination of time, it seems to break down to, on the one hand, duration, and on the other hand, something that lifts you out of duration. Um, that, on the one hand, is something that clearly does interest Smithson. Right? I mean, Passaic is the eternal city. He's got his own stakes in something of that kind. Yet he has a much more acute and tropic sense of duration right, than, than anything in Freed. So, so Freed is both tugging on things that are there for Smithson. Those are real threads in his world. And he's not got the threads right. Um, and I'm not saying that Smithson at that point has them right, but he knows, you know, it's it's a hook, it's, it's a hook that's in him. So is it about the fact that Freud in the on and on of repetition is concerned with how empty it is? It's a sense of emptiness, it doesn't deliver anything back to you. And that being different from saying, when the Smithson talks about the eternal time, yeah. eternal time isn't empty. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's certainly, um, Smithson has an understanding of repetition that is completely at odds with Freed's understanding of duration. Um, and repetition for Smithson makes a difference. And of course, that's something we might say, that's a part of what he does learn from minimalism. Um, so, you know, and these, these critiques are all critiques of what enables a practice not outright rejections of it. I mean, Freed wants minimalism to go away. Smithson wants to make something out of minimalism. So that difference too. But that seems to be right, that, that, that there's a, a really different understanding of repetition. And that, of course, brings us back to the whole business of periodicity and why that, that can be a topic, a topic internal to the making of art for Smithson. It's not some art historian's topic. Right. So, just, would you say as well that Freud's concept of history um, isn't Smithson's concept of history? I'm certainly yeah. thinking that Freud is an art historian. Yeah. Is it more like you know the, the way you describe Chomsky and Roberts kind of pressure Yeah, that's history a that's history. that's a a funny one. I I and I don't know now whether this is simply my resistance to Panofsky or a genuine remark about Freed, I don't see him as, as terribly Panofskyan in sensibility, but he's certainly not Smithsonian. So, yeah. um, and, and also it's, and it gets difficult because Freed's feeling for time has certainly gotten 
increasingly complicated over the course of his career. And so in something like the recent book on Caravaggio, which I think is very good and very interesting, right? It's just called, um, I think it's called The Moment of Caravaggio, isn't it? But the whole point is that the moment itself is divided, right? And that that's what Caravaggio's moment is. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think it's, what, what am I going to say? It's a very rich area. <laughs> the bar? No? Someone? You just talk about divided moment. You, you're referring to the space and um, cuts straight out of Smith's thing. Um, when you were working on as painting, if you as painting displacement and condition, which is your, your three, were space and condition were a crucial element. Could you just talk about, I mean, it seems important in this conversation in some respects, maybe the way things are. <laughs> yeah. Again, I'm not. I'm not sure what's what's useful to say here. I mean, part of the answer would be a kind of autobiographical one. That is, um, at the time we were working on as painting, the work we were dealing with um, got us thinking in terms of division and displacement, um, and that certainly affected how I looked at a lot of other things, right? So it was part of a step on a, on a road. On the other hand, I think it's also relevant to say that, that for whatever reasons, French art as it emerges in the 60s, or a certain range of French art as it emerges in the 60s and 70s, is interested in surface as what, it, as what doesn't happen apart from some depth and that places it in funny ways, you know, close enough to this stuff that in his painting it makes, to us, made good sense to show slant piece next to a hantai, right? Not because they shared a common history, not because the hantai was worried about minimalism, but because they were working with some of the same facts about what was possible for painting, that they had come to along different routes. So I, I don't want to push them too easily together, but I, I, you know, the claim of that show was, in effect, certain kinds of post-minimalist painting, certain kinds of French painting can show together. And what they show turns on matters of things like division and displacement, what it is for a surface to be visible, and, and that kind of thing. Is that, is that enough answer? Where did you put the Smithson in that show? What? Where did you put? When? Where? In Aspensi. It was a Smithson in it, wasn't it? Um, well, Slant Piece was in it. As a matter of fact, the slide I showed at Slant Piece. Um, just as a matter of interest, where was it in that show? What was the proximity to it? Was it? What was it proximate to? Yeah. Um, it, that piece had a. Let's see, I've got to remember what Smithson we had in that show. That piece was funny. You're going to see a lot of the Wexner next week. But. It's a place where all the galleries, in effect, open off to the left of a long ramp. Um, and it was at the end of the ramp. So it wasn't actually very close to anything else. It sort of had its own spot. Um, we had a glass strata piece in the show that somebody backed into at the opening. So it was not there for the run of the show. <coughs> um, I think any. I think there was one other Smithson somewhere in the show, but I cannot at the moment recall where. Hmm. Anybody know? But the Smithson, the Smithson was where it was, partly because 
I'm hesitating because I don't know whether Philip and Laura would agree with this or not, but I think it was there, partly because it was visible sort of from everywhere. Um, I, when I had to give gallery talks there, I tended to start with Smith's and, and work out from there. Well, thank you all. <laughs>